Lady Violet Manners, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Charlie, for having me. Thank you for coming in. You're the eldest daughter of the 11th Duke and Duchess of Rutland and grew up in your family home at the iconic Beaver Castle in Leicestershire. You have this thirst, as I understand, a thirst and passion for culture, travel, art, design, and philosophy, which has led you into a career as a brand strategist and innovation consultant, particularly working with premium and luxury brands such as Abercrombie and Kent, Chilu Group, and Neom. You started your own marketing and brand agency, Akana Collective, in 2020. And I know you've moved away from that now, um, but we'll come on to talk about that Mm -hmm. later. And you're very much involved in the running of your family estate alongside your mother, uh, putting these talents of yours to good use. And the Duchess podcast is a is a good example where you've been um, the executive producer until recently. And I believe also you have you have this sort of particular passion for British heritage, considering your upbringing and. And then I read somewhere that during your stint at UCLA in the States, help you appreciate the extent or impact to which heritage is, is valued internationally rather than be taken for granted. And um, together with your, your two sisters, you're rather well known on the London party scene. And, and you've also enjoyed the trappings of working as a, as a model, walking for the likes of Dolce & Gabbana and being featured in Tatler magazine. Mm-hmm. That's not all of it because, you know, you're, you're here today to talk about something completely different. Yeah. You know, you've got a fascinating story, journey about change and self-awareness. So I'm really excited to be uh, exploring this with you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm excited to get into it all. I know you've got into a lot of the self-development stuff and, you know, you've gone through a, you know, a, a journey of change. What was the catalyst for that? And, you know, what were the first things that you did? I think there's been several catalysts like throughout my life. Um, But I think without question, the most recent one, which was, you know, sort of really the build up to the last one was uh, beginning of last year until about like June of last year. And I was just consumed with like terrible crippling anxiety and intrusive thoughts and, you know, and panic attacks, sort of sporadic panic attacks. And I'd had, you know, panic attacks before in 2018 and I had actually gone to America and and done some really amazing work at, um, at this incredible place in Arizona for a week. It was just like an intensive week. And it was sort of like a it was like a sort of um, a bullet train towards like self-development. You know, there was no mucking around. What but, was the name of the um, it was called Meadows okay. um, and it exists actually, you know, it's for addicts predominantly, but they have another wing of Meadows, which is for self-discovery, really, and and development. And just to get to the root of like, you know, what anxiety where and what prompted my anxiety and panic because I personally am of the view you know I'd always far rather get to the root of you know I think this pandemic of anxiety that exists mm. in young people there's several trends that we you know could probably both point to that have preempted this huge pandemic and rise in sort of anxiety and depression and and panic and I think I was much more keen to get to my the root cause of it versus being put on pills because that's just how I function. I, I'm I'm I, I'm not good at using plasters. I'm much better at sort of allowing things to, to sort of heal naturally or with prompts and with help. In my most recent sort of you know catalyst has actually really taught me to like be still, and 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 what that means and how, you know, and, and allowing myself to be still and to sort of instead of being you know busy doing actually you know I've spent you know the best part of you know, I guess sort of the last eight months up until January of this year, uh, doing a lot of just reflecting, exploring, you know, reading, listening, asking, you know, and, 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 and become it. I think as a result, becoming a, a kind of adopted version of myself that I'm much, much, much happier for. But also last year, I set up a marketing business agency in kind of early, early 2020, just end of 2019, early 2020. And with a partner, who wonderful friend of mine, um, who wasn't a friend at the time actually, but became has become a very dear friend. And um, we set up this agency. We had two sort of you know hard years through COVID, but fortunately, you know, managed to keep busy and very much the business was like thriving. And and um, we were very lucky. 
but then I got to the end of sort of 20, no, I got to the beginning of 2022 and I just can't really describe it, but I just felt this sort of innate sense of, we did an enormous project for the Saudi city uh, called Neom that's being built in 2021, November, 2021. It was like a, it was like the kind of, you know, the client of all clients that you could ever wish to aspire to really as an agency of, of our, you know, size and ilk and everything else. And it was very intense. I mean, we had four months to pull off this enormous event. And I remember I've never worked like that in my life. I mean, it was sort of all hours every day for four months. And I loved every second of it, but it was, it was hard. Um, and got to the end of that year and I just remember a shift and I remember thinking, you know, I don't feel enormously aligned anymore with myself and what I'm doing. Like the, the kind of external projection of, you know, agency founder working with luxury and premium brands was my byline. And I just, I can't describe it, but I just something innately, every time I said it, I felt this sort of innate misalignment, you know, with, within myself. And, you know, I kind of brushed it aside and forgot about it and kept thinking, shut up, Violet, you know, the business is doing brilliantly on paper. Just roll with this. Like, this is what you always wanted. You always wanted to own an agency. You always wanted to sort of be at the head of your own, you know, steering the ship. And and then, you know, and then sort of 2022 rolled in and, you know, still very much had this sort of guttural like instinct that I wasn't, I wasn't feeling aligned and it wasn't sort of ticking the boxes and you know, again, there's that sense of, well, you've got a business partner, you've got a, you know, fledging, you know, a, a sort of thriving business and you've got clients and you've got demands and you've got, you know, outgoings and you, you need to sort of keep this thing going. Um, and we did a big charity event in May uh, of 2022. And I just remember I flew to LA for a holiday with my ex-boyfriend. And I just remember thinking, I've just got to, I just can't do this. I was just like, I just cannot, I just, it, it just doesn't, at all align with who I what I want to be doing in five years from now and, and what I want to be doing in the future and also do I really really feel the need or desire to be selling you know or, or pushing sort of more luxury things and premium things down people's throats no like it's actually you know five years ago I would have been all for it because I was that person you know I was I was that consumer and I was that but I think as I've grown and I've kind of grown in my own understanding of consciousness you know um and an awareness I think it becomes increasingly hard to do something that is hyper, hyper commercialized. And, and, and of course, I still am very commercial in, in how I operate, you know, day to day with the work that I do now. But I think it, the, my point was that the purpose wasn't there for me, mm. like the, the sort of central theme of whatever I do in my life moving forwards needs to be centered around my values or as much of them as, as they possibly And at that point, did you know what your values mm. were? You just had this feeling that it, it, it wasn't aligned you just didn't feel aligned. You didn't feel right. You didn't know what the answer was. No. But it's like it's like it's like walking down the plank of a ship and being like, I know I've got to jump off the end. I don't know whether there's sort of extremely salty seawater down there with like ten sharks, or whether there's a beautiful, pristine sort of you know Caribbean like water that I can jump into and and swim you know in a different direction. That's what it felt like. I allowed it to just rumble on for another month. I just sort of allowed like this. You know, this, and it made me, you know, the, the period from sort of December 21 to July 22, I was just consumed with anxiety. And I mean, you know, I'd walk down the street and I'd sort of have in my mind, you know, the most extraordinary thoughts that I've never had. Like, you're going to get hit by a bike and you're going to fall into the road and be hit by a bus. And it was like these crazy sort of dreamlike intrusive thoughts that were just all consuming and constant. And I've never had that, you know, I'd never had that before. And I remember thinking, how is it that I've gone from being someone that, you know, is pretty happy go lucky, like, you know, always glass half full and always positive, you know, my outlook, generally speaking, is one of optimism and, and positivity. And I was just consumed with this negative sort of trail of thought. And I just remember thinking in July, like, it's just, I can't do this. Like, it's, I, and, you know, of course, now I understand, or at least I have a good sense of why that was that I was having those intrusive thoughts and that anxiety and severe anxiety and it's because I wasn't you know my head and my heart and the external self and the internal one were all completely a muddle and it it makes it very hard it's you know there's not a solid I wasn't standing on a solid patch of of ground I was standing on you know a sort of a veneer of it and 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 it's very hard to operate you know day-to-day -day life um with with that as your as your turf to stand on um so no, I, so last, yeah, so July, 2022, I said to my partner, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I've just, I've just, 
I, I've got to, you know, I've got to get out um, of the business. And it's, it was nothing to do with her. You know, we're still firm friends. And I saw her last week and I'm so grateful that she was so unbelievably understanding. And that's what was so funny is I got sort of, you know, I spent 10 months agonizing about how I'm going to tell her and I feel so responsible. And, and then, of course, when it did come to telling her, it wasn't she was such a big deal. She was so cool. She was so, so cool. And I was so grateful and I was so lucky to have, you know, such an amazing understanding friend and, mm. and you know, someone to work with. My ex-boyfriend and I broke up about a week after I sold my shares to my agency. And that was a big, a big heartbreak, actually. And I remember thinking, yeah, I think this is probably the time. This is like it. This is the sort of like, this is rock bottom. And you know, I just got to go and be more proactive about this. I've got to put time. I had the time because I'd left the business. So I just thought, do you know what? I'm just going to really commit to this. And I'm going to really allow myself to indulge in copious amounts of time, just focusing inwards for, for a bit. And that's never been, that's never been my, you know, my psyche. I've always, always kind of been looking forward. So to navel gaze or be, and allow myself to do that, give myself the permission to do that. And it is a permission. I, I had to give myself permission to do it. Uh, it was terrifying. But, you know, thank God I have done it because it's been life enhancing and transformative. It's it's not for the faint hearted, as I said. Like, I think it takes an enormous amount of courage for anyone to look inwards. Just very, very grateful, you know, as to how everything worked out at the end of last year. You know, because I, by virtue of selling my shares, I had the money and, and resources to be able to go. And I went back to America. I did a week in America in Nashville this time. And at this sort of, again, a very hyper sort of intensive course with incredible people on the course, all from sort of different far-flung corners of the States predominantly. What was this course? Which was, this, what is called, this, this is called Onsite. Exactly the same as the Meadows, basically. But it, it's all in a child work. And it's really been actually in a child work that's kind of, I think it's been an enormous part of my healing. It's been working, doing a lot of inner child therapy opposed to sort of like, you know, I've done therapy for a very long time. But I think that kind of conversational therapy is enormously helpful. But I think for me over the years, I've learned, and this is just through a process of elimination and, and learning what works and doesn't, but I've learned for me, I need to be doing conversational therapy in tandem with EMDR or inner child therapy or something that's a little bit that gets to the root of like stuff uh, much more so. Because obviously when you're talking to a sort of conscious level, I want to get to like the subconscious level and make sure that I can kind of... So EMDR, just for people that don't know, is that the eye? The eye yes, to, yeah. I've actually I wanted to write it down because I thought you might ask and I didn't want to get it wrong. But it's yeah, it's structured therapy that encourages the patient to focus briefly on the trauma memory mm. with simultaneous um, eye movements, and it's associated with a reduction in vividness and emotion. And it's it's called it stands for eye movement desensitization. That's right, and reprocessing. And it's a way almost you know rather than just. Uh, traditional talk therapy it's a way almost to sort of hack hacking into the subconscious well, a little a little bit because it's a bilateral stimulation of the brain so you're you're stimulating the left and right hemisphere of your brain and by virtue so the, the way that someone described it to me and i hope i don't bastardize this too much but um when you're traumatized as a child and it can be so i mean trauma is such a sort of heavy it's such word, a strong word yeah it's it's, it's, it's misunderstood it's misunderstood it's some experiences that influence us yeah almost, and, and, yeah. A, and, a, and a, on a subconscious level you know more often than not they, they are sort of stuck they're like they're stuck in our sort of psyche and, and and a trauma does actually stay in the brain i think it's the right hand side of your brain that's emotional left hand side that's rational and by virtue of stimulating the two focused on this particular trauma and memory means that you're you're recreating a new neuro pathway in relation to that trauma. Okay. So you're you're essentially just rewiring the rational and the and the emotional around that particular trauma, around that particular memory. Got it. That's EMDR. EMDR. And then there was the traditional talk therapy. What was the the third one? The the child the inner child inner work. child work. Yeah. Isn't inner child work talk therapy as well? It is. But it's just a different modality, right? Exactly. And so just talk to me a little bit about, about this inner child work, because it, it feels to me that that was quite significant for you. You know, yeah. what, what kind of things did, did that unlock for you? I mean, you know, funnily enough, they're not, so both at the Meadows and on site and in the work that I've done in London, in, you know, with, with my therapist and, and previous work that I've done, they talk a lot about like reparenting your inner child. And I listened to a podcast the other day on Diver CEO with a guy called Dr. Daniel Arman, and he describes how he sort of, you know, he's named his brain like, I don't know, Dan, um, you know, Douglas, whatever. Um, and 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 so when there's intrusive thoughts, when there's sort of negative thoughts, whatever, he sort of refers to that as being Douglas's sort of negative thoughts. 
actually, I personally, that's not how I look at, you know, my development. I, I think for me, it was about, you know, I think to understand myself, I had to understand my sort of, I call little Vi. I had to like understand like, what was it? What is it that continues to sort of trigger and 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 cause sort of reactions versus responses in the way that I as an adult conduct my life? Um, and the way in which they get you to that inner child place at these intensives is hardcore. And it's, and it, as in, because it's emotionally, Extra- it's extraordinary the work that these people do and it's unbelievable the training that goes on and it's a huge sadness to me that nowhere like this exists I mean lots of people often say oh have you done the Hoffman to me and I said no no, no. The Hoffman's great and I and I, I've never done it I wouldn't take anything away from it but I but to my understanding it's nowhere near as intricate and deep as the work that you can find and go and do in the states that I've done I understand. And, the, and the Hoffman for for people listening it's a week-long yeah. process yeah. cost Got a lot of money as well. These things, you you go down there, stay on site, and they they take you through a process of of self discovery and self awareness, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah. similar. Yeah. But the but the work that you know to get to sort of doing inner child work. I mean, I don't think it has to be. You certainly don't need to go and do what I've done. You know, uh, in the states to to sort of be able to tap into this kind of work. But I think for me, what it's meant is that I've just reparented my my younger self, and it's meant that when in moments where I feel hyper vigilant or triggered or anxious you know I often I'm now in a position to actually ask okay is this is this Violet as you know soon to be 30 year old Violet reacting responding to this or is this you know is this is this an old sort of worry or concern or trigger of of a younger version of myself that just needs to be perhaps made you know there needs to be some awareness around it and then it means that I can just you know and and it makes me sound you know it might make me sound a little little dotty saying that but I think for me it's it's we all have an inner child, whether you you know acknowledge it or not, is a different thing. But we do, and I think for me, learning about that younger version of myself has meant that my life today is so much fu- you know so much fuller. It's like it's meant that I've got back into dance and I've got back into because that's what I used to love to do as a kid, and I've spent the last ten years neglecting that side of my character that I really I now fully embrace. And and every time I dance, I feel connected to you know my younger self, and I think. I guess the you know question people might be thinking is well why why is it important why why care about that, but I care because it means that it 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 means that I'm my most authentic self ninety nine percent of the time versus being the sort of disjointed self that I ended up being at the end you know the last year and arguably the last few years. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, a, a lot of this stuff can be quite subjective and intangible Massively. and really hard for people to wrap their heads around. But I mean, ultimately what it does for people, clearly with you, like at the end of the day, it's helping you to have a, a better life experience, you yeah. know, a more fulfilled, you know, you know, a, a more joyful, optimal life experience. Can we just talk, just dig in a little bit? And I, I appreciate some of it might be quite personal, et cetera. So just, you know, tell, say, say, Charlie, we've gone too far <laughs> if we, if we go too far, okay. but you know, this inner child stuff, and you, you you mentioned the reparenting and stuff. Like, what are we actually talking about here? Is it kind of like the environment that you grew up in with your parents and home and family and school and stuff and like certain needs that weren't met or, you know, certain dynamic that, you know, you weren't allowed to express when you were younger or you were, you know, conditioned to think a certain thing, which turned out not to be true. Uh, are these the kind of things? I think it's a bit of all of that probably. And I, you know, I don't think that probably exists for all of us to to a greater or lesser extent, but I think for me it was, I mean, there's so much, but I, th- I think really the crux of it was I've been fascinated in self-development for, you know, the best part of six years now. And I never, up until literally sort of six seven months ago, when everyone used to say, you know, understand your needs, whenever else, I was like, what the hell are they on about understanding my needs? What does that mean? Like, what, do, what is there to understand? I just function. Like I'm here, I'm functioning. I assert my needs, I think. I don't really know what they, but I could never name what my needs were. Much like I couldn't name what I was feeling in any given moment. I think my, yeah, the reparenting my inner child was like, you know, every time I felt unseen abandoned you know and abandoned again is that's a dramatic word to use but it and it, it has a myriad of meanings behind it mine are not extreme you know my parents were very present and i was lucky you know i've got a huge family and um we were always very supported but i think by virtue of being a big family there's and there's only two parents five children there's you know there's only so much time your parents can dedicate to you 
And so, you know, that's that was where my abandonment stuff was coming from, was just feeling like I was, you know, I was kind of always vying for attention and never getting enough of it, you know? And I think I think it's about, I think my reparenting has been centered on lots of themes, but that's one of them that I just described. Another would be very badly bullied at my first school. I'm dyslexic, so very badly bullied at my first school, but actually by a teacher. And 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 as a result, it meant that I I think I again, I just didn't I I I just didn't, I was, you know, reparenting that has been about teaching myself like that in, intrinsic value that we just have by virtue of being a human. You have an intrinsic value, regardless of whether you get A stars or fucking, you know, Ds, there is an intrinsic value by virtue of you just being here, breathing and being alive. And actually the moment that you can, I think for me, it was about going back and reparenting my little self to understand that that is, a, you know, you have an intrinsic value, even though you were crap at maths and, you know, your teacher was horrible to you consistently. And, and, and like, you know, there was a lot of that that I had to reparent in myself and frankly will continue to, I'm sure. Yeah, just a lot of, you know, a lot of different things, Charlie. But I think, I think for me, it, it's really, I think reparenting just means and this is, you know, again, this this terminology is used in relation to EMDR because, again, you're sinking back into memories. But honestly, sometimes I'll sit there and I'll think, where the hell did that come from? I've never consciously thought about it. But my therapy, you know, my the work that I've done has managed to get me to places and memories that I've literally locked sort of seven volts down. That's what it feels like to me. You know, I've tapped into things that I had no idea were there on a conscious level, but the nature of this kind of work is is incredible and remarkable mm, because mm. It, it just digs so much deeper. It is amazing how much we hold, <clears throat> how many memories, emotional habits we hold in our, our subconscious for years. And in those informative years, like single digits, teenagers or whatever, like we're, you know, our personality is being shaped by our our environment. And, and it can take, you know, a, a lot of the stuff that, you know, we're talking about. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about because I've done similar similar things but i think to a lot of people it can sound very mumbo jumbo and particularly with you know some of these words like trauma or abandonment and then it becomes really hard if you're not getting the right advice to even even using those words if you're trying to have a conversation with your parents and then that that can be really difficult so you just by changing words and things it can it can change conversations and things but yeah i think just from a like a you know really basic level like things that happen when you're growing up relationships with people schools mm. media what we listen to what we what we think about ourselves you know that can have a big impact in our confidence or you know what we think about what a relation like a romantic relationship is what we think about like what we are capable of you know we all we go through life and everything's very like reactive and automatic and we bat and random we we bounce through the sort of chaos and serendipity of life Tasty. and you know, there there can often be this 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 misalignment of our sort of our, our deeper essence that's mm-hmm. become misaligned with you know the world that we've created around us from the thoughts, you know, feelings and actions as as, as a byproduct of these emotional habits. And some of those emotional habits might not be, you know, aligned with your with with one's essence. So to be able to do what you've done and just take a bit of a pause and to take a look, you know, often it's it's clearly there's a bit of a catalyst. You're not Huge, feeling how, yeah. how you want to hit. You're feeling clearly you were very privileged to be able to afford that time to, to do that and go through that process mm-hmm. and then pop up. I'm sure we'll hit, hear a little bit more about the go forward in a minute, but pop mm-hmm. up more aligned and more calm and more clear. And particularly with the chaos in the world that we live in today with so much temptation, distraction, Crazy. options. I, I think it's a bit of a superpower to like, have that alignment and have that clarity around like what works for you totally and then when you have that then it's easier to say no to things you I know? agree and I think that was the other thing is I you know I arrived in London when I was 18 I went to school in North, North Yorkshire you know my parents brought us up in a very you know despite where we grew up and 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 that kind of thing like you know we were brought up in a very 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 down-to-earth kind of way and so I think arriving in London and being sort of slightly catapulted into that world of but I was, you know, if I'm really honest, I definitely was kind of keen to sort of live up to, I thought the idea of living up to like, you know, my my great grandmother or my aunts um, uh, or, or even my great great aunts sort of, you know, personalities and reputations, I thought was something to be desired. Well, uh, vivacious, but, socialite you know, in London. Yeah. yeah. And age 18, like, you know, I came to London, was working for British Pro Day and I remember thinking, 
this is you know what fun how much fun to be going to all these fun things but I think you know so so I think actually my my world my life the last 10 years was that much more layered than perhaps others on the basis that there was assumptions being made from the moment I arrived that I was going to live up to this person and I then started playing up to it and I think if I'm honest now looking back you know it's meant that I've had to go on a massive rewilding process an unlearning process to, to understand like okay sure so you know I spent two years Maybe a bit longer, if I'm really honest. But I, I spent two years thinking or three years thinking it would be really fun to sort of, you know, I was wor- always working hard. That's never been, that's always been a constant. And that was never what was really reflected in, you know, anything that was being written about me or my sisters. But we've always been taught to work hard and, and play hard, you know, where and when you can. My my whole sort of life journey for the last 10 years was, I think, doubly layered because I, there was a there was an expectation I put on myself and, and one that was then mirrored with what was being written or projected onto me. So... It's been even more of a kind of cataclysmic unlearning process for me of really trying to figure out who the, you know, who the, who I am and, and really what I, you know, what I stand for and want to stand for more importantly in the future and and what I want to put my time to and being much more, as I said, I'm not that great at planning ahead, but I think now, you know, turning 30 this year, I think it's a really seminal time for many of us, you know, turning 30, you know, Kagi Dunlop talks about Saturn returns and I, I'm massively into astrology as well. So I think... I for sure think there's something in it, but I think it's a it's a turning point for sure. You know, you leave your twenties behind, and there's plenty of you know Instagram pages that talk about you know what you should know in your twenties and what you should know in your thirties, and and I and I really I really wanted to use this last year, or certainly the last ten months that I've had and been able to afford to have some time to to really hone in on exactly who I want to be for the next ten years. And sure, like my intrinsic character, I, I'm never gonna you know massively sort of change it dramatically but I, I I wanted to get to a point where I stopped reacting to life and I started being able to harness a response and and like and started being able to understand what it truly means to stand in one's power and I, I never really understood that expression or description or you know it's a great sort of strap line that lots of people have used in different contexts and my mom used to say it to me you know my mom used to say darling you want to reclaim a bit of your power, you know, take back sort of charge of, I was like, what the hell are you on about? I have no idea what she was on about, but I really have learned to understand that. And it doesn't mean, you know, sort of chest bearing and, and beating your chest or anything like that. It more means it's a quiet, it's a very quiet power. It's a quiet understanding of oneself. And by virtue of understanding oneself, I think you're able to respond far more than, than, than I certainly ever have before versus react to life. And be much more intentional and intuitive about these things, but in a much more sort of meaningful, purposeful way. And listen, like that is not like that's the dream, right? It's not the day to day reality. And but I think it's about for me, it was about making sure that when there are bumps in the road, you know, it's something as simple as like fucking, I don't know, you know, very minor things to the really big, important things. It's about being able to ride the ride the waves, like ride the bumps and not and not be completely thrown off like I was last year, because I really now know what it feels like to be in a complete tunnel of, of ter- you know, of, of, of sort of true sort of, I don't want to use the word terror, maybe not, but just, you know, scared of life. I think I was very scared of life last year. And I think to now be sitting here and feel so balanced in many ways, but it's because I've, you know, I've, I've done the work and I understand, you know, life gets busy and then it sort of oscillates. And, and I think, but my the point is that I now know what I need to do every single day to set myself up as best I possibly can for a good day, a good week, a good month. And there are going to be moments within that that are disastrous and it's never always going to be kind of plain sailing. You know, it's been fascinating and I'm so unbelievably grateful for the breakup, the, the you know, leaving of business, the panic attacks. I, I truly mean that when I say I'm grateful because I think it's led you to this moment. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think I'm a, I'm unequivocally a better person for it, like mm. unequivocally. I can say, I mean, it's the first time we've met, yeah. but you you certainly feel very calm and content. And and I, and I think you know you made a good point. Like it's never perfect, but it's that there's a there's a real shift from being like reactive and random to being more deliberate and assertive where you're yeah. putting your en- energy and attention which which also you know you want to, i've got to be careful because i also know because of this now sort of new understanding of myself i know spontaneity is a big big part of my life that gives me enormous joy actually on the on the Stephen podcast that i mentioned um darby CEO, this fascinating doctor called dr daniel arman was speaking about brain types and he was referring to there's five brain types and he's written extensively about them but one of them is spontaneous, balanced, perceptive, 
cautious. Um, I can't remember the fifth. I'm definitely spontaneous. And actually his description of it was so accurate. And I know that my day to day needs to be sort of, there needs to be a routine, some semblance of a routine to start it, to end it. But life in between, you know, the morning and the evening, I need to also make room for spontaneity where I can and for being, because that feeds my inner child. And by virtue of feeding my inner child, I then am like a, a much more attuned, content, fulfilled adult. And I, and I, and I know that sounds gaga to probably lots of people, but it's, there's extensive work that's gone on behind this inner child work that I've been describing that, that like, that proves and shows it, it can help just, and it's not, it's not like I sort of think, oh, you know, every day, oh, I've got to go make sure I go dancing to sort of serve my inner child. It, but it's just now I know intuitively. You give that, yourself that space for, yeah. for, for the unknown. And what yeah. are the, some of the, some of the things you do like in the morning and to set yourself up? So, those... I mean, I consistently now meditate yeah. and I got into meditation in April of 2020. I was given Deepak Chopra, someone I followed for some time. I've had a Deepak huge, Chopra. Yes. But I've had a long love of India and it's been a very, it's been a place that I always, and like a homing pigeon, I've always gone back to, particularly at moments in my life where I've really had difficulty. Um, I've always found myself sort of gravitating towards going back to India. I think you can find such peace in the chaos of India and in the colour of India and the kind of the mat, you know, the, the the kind of the pace of it, funnily enough, is where I find I may I've been able to find such stillness in that pace. Um but I um no, so the morning, my morning and evening routine, again, I'm not seeking perfection. I don't advocate perfection. I think it's I think that's a fallacy to sort of suggest anything otherwise. But I but I do try to ensure every morning I meditate, even if it's just for five minutes, I try to do 20 to 30, but if it's just five minutes, you know, that's fine. And I've worked with one of Deepak Chopra's sort of disciples and and she's given me my own mantra. And so there's uh, and Deepak Chopra came up with a form of meditation that is much like transcendental meditation, which you may have heard of, but um, it's his own version of it. And you meditate for 20 minutes silently in your head with a mantra. And the idea being really that the mantra is just a way of kind of consuming your brain with one strap line. It's all related to the time you're born, place you're born. And, and then I try, you know, I've, I think um, Spotify is such an amazing resource and I just listen to like positive affirmations in the morning. I have some positive affirmations on my bathroom wall. Um, you know, they get sort of pulled down when friends are coming over. <laughs> but I have them there in the morning. Um, and I just, yeah, I try and just, they're the two kind of main pillars. And getting up early, I'm really like an early morning riser. I love that sort of 30 minutes from six or six thirty or sort of quarter seven where it's very quiet on my street and I can just, you know, there's a but that's the time that I feel very much like I try and carve out for this sort of stuff. And then but that tends to be it. And then I a movement for me is central. I think movement releases energy and sort of stored energy and stored sort of like expressions. And I think meditation for me consolidates. My, it allows, I, I think meditation for me is like an incubator. It allows me to sort of incubate where I'm at, what I'm feeling, and then also, also just sort of just find that stillness. And and I think movement for me is like the antithesis. It's like, it's, it's getting things out. It's like, it's just, it's just freeing myself of any energy that's not, I, I don't want to sort of carry into my day. So if I can m- exercise in the morning, that's kind of crucial for me. So just, I just want to touch on something you mentioned earlier, you know, th- this process that you've gone through of almost, you know, you had a certain expectation and things that are written about you and you know that person that you, like, you how many years ago you you aspired to be you became that person you wanted to be right and then you kind of you unpick it you realize that you know you, you're not aligned you're not really doing what you want to do and um there's a transition of you you know almost kind of like becoming like altering your personality to an extent or you know m- maybe that's a bit strong but transitioning into a, a different type of person like did you find that difficult because I suppose a lot of those things that you were pegs that you're hanging your coat on before were giving you your that's what you stood for as a person that's what gave you your self-worth so if you start moving away from those things is, is it hard to then you know you're sort of in a, in a sort of no man's land before you find your those new pegs to hang your coat on does saying. that make sense it, do, it didn't but it didn't give me any self-worth it didn't give me any self-worth and actually right. it didn't give me I thought it did at the time. I can now sit here and say, I know it didn't. And if anything, it gave me a very unsolid foundation to stand on because I was, I was my self-worth was uh, for a time, and this is when I was much younger, but you know, from the age of like 18 to 25, or whatever, I, I think a lot of my self-worth was based on 
validation from others and external validation and be it, you know, silly articles in the press that were completely, you know, uh, so not um, not a true reflection of who I even was at that time, let alone who I am now. But I think also I will still forever, I'm sure we all do, we all like external validation. So I'm not going to sit here and say that I'm kind of godlier than that. But I, but I think I've, what I've realized is that it wasn't, they, they weren't solid foundations that I was standing on and they were too they were they were subject to be not you know quite easily knocked over or 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 and thereby I'd start reacting to life because that you know they were sort of quite easily knocked and actually now you know I think I am standing on a much more solid patch of ground just by virtue of the fact that I don't prescribe an enormous amount of value I can be very grateful for and appreciate any external validation that I get I I try you know day to day to ensure that as long as I'm content with how I'm showing up how I'm responding to situations. I think all of our lives are just a, a sequence of choices. And I think if I can ensure that as many of those choices are ones that I really am choosing, opposed to reacting and then regretting the way that I reacted to something, I, I'm I'm much, much more content. So I don't I don't think there was an enormous amount of self-worth um attached to that, you know. What about the sort of you you being a certain way before and then okay. coming back, you know, coming yeah. back to sort of family, friends work and you know was there was there a kind of like was there a caution or you know you're a bit nervous about like turning up you know the new no. violet and what people might think and expect you to be a certain way I don't you know because I don't think it's that dramatic I think right. I think a lot of my friends when they hear this podcast go out they'll be like sure exactly the same you know there's so <laughs> much of you that's exactly the same I don't think as again to my point about power earlier I think it's a very quiet and an internal shift that's been made externally to so many people that perhaps don't have the same kind of awareness or consciousness and that's not that I'm, I'm not saying that as a bad thing I think everyone as we said earlier like is on their own journey but I think they probably won't know and I'll never have this kind of conversation with that group of friends and that's okay like I love that group of friends that I'm you know I adore them and I love that I don't have to talk about this stuff with them and, I, and it's never going to form a part of our conversation or our relationship but it's also amazing how many of that, you know, a particular group of my friends, it's amazing how many of them, by virtue of me doing my work, you know, and I've I've often just sort of like dropped it into a conversation on occasion. And then it's amazing who picks up on it and wants to talk more about that stuff that I wouldn't have thought would have wanted to talk about it more. I want to get into like some more of the like the tangible things that you actually did or the workshops you did or the courses you went on. So you went to Nashville for that week and then what happened after that? You know, were you doing more therapy back in London or were you doing courses, workshops? Is it reading? Yeah, so I know I spent like a lot of time, as I said, like, you know, reading, listening, asking, learning, exploring, experiencing different things. So that period of getting back from the States, you know, I was enormously heartbroken, um, very, very at sea in that sense. And I, you know, and I got back and I just thought, you know, I'm just going to book myself on courses that I've always wanted to do. And they're not retreat courses, they're not psychotherapy courses. It was like, I've always wanted to go and do a week's dance course. And I actually learned like some routines and actually learned like a bit of ballet and a bit of jazz and a bit of all of these things. So that was something I booked immediately after getting back from the States. And I did it for a week at the Royal Academy in um, East London. And then I also went and did a week's retreat, but it was like an intellectual retreat. It was led by Zach Bush and it was with Ed Olver and it was up at a place called Broughton Hall, which is this beautiful old um, sort of stately home up in North Yorkshire. I went and did that for a week and it was the most unbelievably eclectic group of people. You know, people have flown in from Bali, from the States, from Philippines. It was incredible. And that really felt like a sort of, you know, I really sort of pulled myself, like the socket was out and I just allowed myself to just really like soak up the incredible um, experiences that I was affording myself. and. You know, there's a lot of that. And then of course, like I'm now consistent with my therapy and I and and I think that's a big like that will be a big part of my for me, that's a big part of my routine that I just know, you know, every other week I just need a check-in. And that's and that's for how I envisage it. I don't envisage it as this sort of massively dramatic, like, oh my God, get me to my therapist sort of moment. But I think it's just a it's a weekly check-in, a, a so bi-weekly check-in that just keeps me, you know, just just helps me sort of reflect on where I'm at, what's happened recently that maybe I'm feeling, you know, I could have handled better or I'm feeling hyper emotional about this for some reason or this keeps coming up in my mind. I wonder, you know, just get to the root of things. You know, I now have a much, I'm armed, you know, with a great toolkit of, of practices, rituals, routines, you know, 
and and sort of check-ins with myself that again I'd never have done before I've never ever thought about sort of you know actually thinking I don't know if you find yourself Charlie but I one of the things that I've learned over the years as well and more this is again a very recent one for me but so much of when I'm in a conversation with people I'm so often thinking or I've been inclined to so often think what are they thinking about me what are they like what's going on in their head right now? Like, am I, they're smiling. So does that mean that what I just said was funny or did it interest them or was it informative to them? Or I'm consumed with what you're thinking, right? Mm-hmm. I was. And so much of conversations now is like, how am I, like, how am I feeling about the fact that I'm saying what I'm saying or feeling what I'm feeling or doing what I'm doing? And I think so much of our life is, is, you know, from the age of three, if you're shoved into nursery, which a lot of, you know, kids need to be, because obviously it's so expensive now for parents to keep their you know, keep their kids at home and try and work and everything else. But I think so much of our life from a very young age is about seeking external validation, seeking external stimulants. And, and you know, and if you grow up in a household that's perhaps, you know, slightly more hypervigilant or whatever, then it means that's even more sort of accentuated. And actually, I've really learned over the last six months that I'm totally engaged with you. I'm totally in this moment right now, but I'm also totally in myself and I'm totally aware of what I'm feeling and thinking right now in this moment and you know that again I'm I'm there's a level of presence that I've never experienced up until recently as a result of it it's not it's just it's it's a breath of fresh air frankly to just be I think having gone through life being so concerned about you know impressions of my you know of me being imparted on people and what they're thinking and it's such a joy to sort of be slightly less concerned with that and more concerned with actually how I'm feeling you know in relation to them and 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 uh, in any given moment, it's just it's a relief, frankly, to be that way inclined now. What advice would you give to people who, you know, maybe don't have as much time as you, the resources, you know, getting getting in, you know, just start just starting off, you know, if they're feeling how you were feeling yeah. back then. For me, it started with just listening and reading. And have you got any examples? Come so on, give many. us some. Give, give, okay, give I, us actually, some, I did actually write a list because I thought I, I want to hear I'm all of them because I know you've got lots of um, um, okay, well, great recommendations. Okay, well, there's really amazing podcasts like Eckhart Tolle's Essential Teachings, which is actually produced by Oprah Winfrey's company. Um, Slow Mo, Mo Gaudat, Interesting Conversations. He was the head of the Google AI sort of office, but he's actually, again, like he's had a fascinating. Uh, unlearning like throughout his life you Resolve know. for Happy is he the author of that book? Uh, I yes I think yeah. he is and um, and his podcast is brilliant um, Happy Place I think my fan Cotton's great they you know there was an episode this week on boundaries and I thought that was brilliant and then for me there's also an American uh, podcast called To Be Magnetic and Lacey she's called Lacey Tomlinson and again she was on that I sort of I kind of you know heard about when I was living in the States but one of the things that I'll never, well, I forever use and sort of, you know, share to those who are interested, but I think it's amazing how she's reframed being envious. You know, we can all be envious of different people and their lives and everything. And and she's reframed that entirely and coined the phrase expanders. So anyone that you're envious of or jealous of is an expander for you. So if you look at them through mm. the lens of expansion that's something that you admire you sort of put them on your vision board or however you like to sort of or in yeah I really eye. like that actually I love that because I think it's you know by virtue of being jealous that person you're there's something about their life there's something that you admire and want to desire for yourself and it's it, they're expanders they're expanding your 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 own sort of vision for your life and I think I, I anyway so that was I just, really I really like that and I think that <clears> you know, I think it's one of the famous Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger lines where you know the the world is not driven by greed it's driven by envy and yeah. i think it's you know it's so true and again it's one of those like super cynical words but it's in all of us you know i get envious about people and things sometimes but there there you're right there's that distinction where you if you can twist it to be you know hang on yeah i'm i, I am envious of that yes. person and but i don't think they're a dick i quite, i'm going to work harder and and I'm going to learn from and them, and, your, and, and I'm going to be inspired by them. Yeah, and they're expanding your your concept of what you want in life. Like for me, I genuinely look at people now and I think, gosh, you know, anyone that I'm sort of inspired by or or have been jealous or envious of, I just think, God, they're they're expanding my own vision of self, my own vision of what I want in my life. And I think that's a wonderful way to reframe. Um, and then there's Instagram pages which I love. Um, so the holistic psychologist, who you probably know. I've actually went to one of her like meditations on a beach in the States when I was over there and she's incredible. Um, Zach Bush is really interesting, but he, you know, his background was as, as a scientist and then he sort of come into spiritualism and he's sort of the bridge between the two and he's 
you know, I think he's got half a million followers on Instagram, but he he is formidable. And the way that he sort of deciphers the science and spiritual sort of arguments and unites them is is so powerful to follow. Um, and then Dr. Daniel Arman, who I, it was a recent one to me, but he was on Stephen Bartlett's um, okay. show. And he's so fascinating about brain scans and and uh and how that then informs personality types and characteristics and blah 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 and then i also for me like there's a you know there's another melissa she's called melissa wood tefferberg and i'd never i don't even know how the hell i started following her but she has like a fitness business in the states and it's you know quick sort of on the mat exercises and her kind of phrase that she's coined is like how bad do you want to feel good and I think it's a really wonderful thing. I like that. It's really wonderful because how bad, she always uses it in the context of how bad you want to feel good. If you really want to feel good, then you're going to get up a little bit early. You're going to go, and that's her whole sort of shit. And that speaks to a little bit about what we were speaking about at the very beginning. Yeah. And I was telling you a little bit about, you know, why I was doing what I was doing. Mm. And, and we both agreed on the, uh, you know, on the notion that most people only get into this sort of stuff when it really gets totally. too difficult or... Yeah, you've hit rock bottom. Dark. There's a darkness, but but it. it's you know tr trying to. I think what a lot of people are trying to do is you know tr trying to try and sort of just shine a light on a lot of this cool stuff that people can do. Like, and you don't have things don't have to be that bad. No, to and it's and it's and the point is it's at your it's at so many of our fingertips. I mean, I worked for a bit of time. We had better health, well, better help. Yes, yeah. yeah, the online coaching, the online coaching. Th no, the th therapy. The therapy platform, and it's very accessible. It makes therapy very accessible, affordable, by virtue of being online. And like they sponsored the podcast that I did with my mother for a time, and we were so thrilled that they did because I didn't, I couldn't care less about how much money. I think we made nothing off them, but I actually really cared about the message that they were delivering. You know, I struggle with the like uh, to sort of understand how our education system. Well, what our education education system, particularly for young kids, it looks like. I think it's sort of. I wish there was so much more time spent, you know, not sort of trying to stimulate three to four year old kids with like algebra or numbers or anything, you know. Actually, just about teaching them to, to sort of go inward a little bit and, and arming um, themselves with yeah. the, a lot of these things. Because I think, and that's why with. I think the work that you know the Duke, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge or um, Prince and Princess of Wales are doing you know, with early child, like the early child work that they're doing is so important and it's so credible. And it's, I hope it really does shift the dial in terms of um, what kids are, are taught at schools, um, at least in those early years, which are the most informative, as she, as she said, um, the Prince of Wales has said. But um, so so they're probably my top. I mean, I think, yeah, Melissa with Tepperbug's great. And then I also, there's this wonderful girl called Sam. Her name is Sam Moves on Instagram. And she's the one, I mean, I do actually put a lot of credit to her for She's kind of encouraged me to, in a funny way, she doesn't know this at all. I mean, I have messaged her and we have had a conversation about it, but um, I, I've been inspired by her. She shares lots of videos of her dancing around and just, I think her mantra is like, be weird, be you. And I and I kind of, I love that because I think it's encouraged me to sort of tap back into a bit of dance and and not be bashful about it, you know, and, and kind of embrace that side of, side of me. Um, there's like, there's lots of books as well, you know, that I've read. I'm reading the most amazing book at the moment called Science and Spiritual Practices, Reconnecting Through Direct Experience. And it's by a philosopher and, and writer called Rupert Sheldrake, um, who I've actually met recently. And I mean, I will never, ever, ever describe this book and do it justice because it's so mind-blowingly extraordinary. Um, he went, you know, as he went to sort of India um as a scientist and an atheist, like I can't remember when sort of been exactly when guessing the 70s. Um and after spending seven years living there, you know, married, ultimately having his children there, he's gone on the most extraordinary journey, you know, coming from a scientific background and understanding spiritualism. And again, he's like the Brit, he's a bridge between the two and the book, the books that he's written. I'm only on my first one. He he kind of very kindly handed it to me and said, I think this is where you need to start, Violet. And then there's a litany of others that you That's can That's a good through. reason to read a book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, is it is, is more of a story with the lessons in there or is it no, more of a no, kind of non-fiction? Non-fiction, yeah. yeah. It's and it's um, but it's fascinating and lots of anecdotes and stories of his personal, you know, personal stories of his life. And then there's also, you know, other great books like Codependent No More by Melanie Beatty. That's a that's a kind of that's a page turner that I will always go to in moments of doubt or if I need to sort of feel like I'm stuck on something and more relationship focused, but I think it's an amazing book. Um, the Dance Cure by Dr. Peter Lovett, the amazing research that's gone into what dance, you know, how unbelievably important actually dance is and will be in the future for, for all of us. I mean, like kind of crazy statistics, like, you know, 
dancing sort of brings us back to a much more like primitive and therefore more liberated state of mind. And so it means that they've actually tested it. At Dr. Peter Lovett has at Hartford University. And it and he actually tested it and meant that those that dance for 20 minutes improv dancing were able to solve divergent tasks. So that people could solve divergent tasks much more quickly. What's a divergent task? Just just tasks that require like lateral thinking, much more okay, lateral okay. thinking. They just got the juices flowing. Yeah, more. because it's because you're it... literally you're improv dancing, you're allowing your mind to just wander and sort of and then, you know, emotional high that you get from dancing is extraordinary. They've done credible tests on people with Parkinson's. And actually at the Royal Ballet Academy actually has a weekly Parkinson's dance class. Oh wow. <clears throat> the Doctor People to Love It did a sort of Channel Four series on in 2012. And it's about how, and my grandfather died of Parkinson's, so I'm particularly interested in this, but um, it's about how unbelievably brilliant dance is. It's not a cure for Parkinson's, but it just ensures that those neural pathways that um, are shut off. I think Parkinson's- Stimulates. Stimulates. Stimulates stimulate serotonin, stimulates dopamine, which both of which are deeply affected when you have Parkinson's. So um, it gives you, it gives people with Parkinson's a sort of a high, but also it sort of, it sustains a, a level of brain function and delays basically ultimately is what they're trying to test. And I'm sure they will go on to prove. I suppose, you know, linking back to some of the inner child work that you did previously and figuring stuff out yeah. about yourself and, you know, bringing it, winding everything back to like the practicalities of everyday life. Totally. You and, you know, relationships, romantic relationships has the work that you've done you know, change the way that, you know, you go about that or, you know, had, had a, had a, had a positive impact, impact in that area of your life? Yeah, I think, I think so. I mean, I would like to think so. And certainly in the future, I, I hope it does. I think it's, um, you know, I think it's, yeah, I, I, I almost certain it will. And, and I almost like, uh, and I'm, you know, committed to frankly, I, I think the over-dependence on anything, be it drugs or alcohol or, or sex or, um, you know, or in my case, like sometimes in the past I've over, you know, relied on others to sort of, I guess, fill, fill that void. And now that I understand what that void is and where it came from and, you know, and there's so many different things that, that meant that void existed within me. Um, now that I understand it so much clear, more clearly, I'm, I'm responsible for it. Like I, that's for me to fill. That's not for anyone else to fill. Like I want, you know, whoever, that comes into my life next to hopefully have their cup already full or at least an understanding of what they need to fill theirs. And I'm, and I'm responsible for filling mine. And I also think that's, that carries into my work as well. You know, I, I'm very clear now on what I want to do and what I want to put my time towards professionally. And that's because I understand myself and what I need and want to do and want to put out in the world that that's going to add to that. I think a lot of what I was doing before was taking away from me and yeah. actually I, th I think sorry to, <laughs> no, to no, cut please. you off but I mean I, I just think that you know good for you for doing that and I, and I think you know relationships boyfriend girlfriends husband wife you know whatever it's it, it's such a it's such a great practical example of you know some people go through life who maybe haven't gone through a process of self-awareness and it's you know, they're either maybe they can't get a relationship or they're always in toxic relationships or they're stuck and you know, having someone, you know, a healthy relationship, a romantic relationship, well, you know, it, it, it's a big part of life. It's yeah. part of the essence of life. I mean, okay, everyone wants different things, but whatever you want out of that, that realm, it has a huge bearing on how great your life, one's life experience is. And, it, and, and it, by, by doing these kind of things that you're doing and you can unlock things and realize things and, you know. Well, yeah. And also I think, sorry to cut you off now, but I also think what's so important for me is I noticed a pattern. I noticed a pattern and I was like, do I want this? You know, this time last summer, kind of the pattern was becoming very clear and, you know, definitely preempted the breakup. And I, um, and I think I just remember thinking after the breakup, like, okay, this has happened a little bit too often in my life for, for me to be now be comfortable with it. 29, you know, I, again, going back to like, I really want to turn a, a turn of leaf is perhaps again, a bit too sort of dramatic, but I, you know, I really want the rest of my, you know, the next 10 years of my life to be a little bit more deliberate. And, and that, I mean, you know, that's my responsibility. And, and I think noticing patterns, noticing patterns in oneself, that informs the change. Like, I think when we don't notice, we don't have an awareness around ourselves. It's very difficult. You've just reminded me something as well. So, you know, I've, I've been meaning to ask you, so 
do we now know what your values are and what you want to do and what does the future look like for you, Violet? Yeah, I think I I do have, I mean, you know, as again, I think my nature and and to use sort of Dr. Daniel Armand's like description, I'm spontaneous. My brain type is without question spontaneous. And like lo and behold, they are geared towards being entrepreneurial, but they're also geared towards being quite, you know, um, I mean, there's so many words he used to describe spontaneous brain sets, but um, but I think I I'm I'm much clearer than I probably ever have been. And I'm also, again, as a result of being a little bit clearer, I'm much more I'm being a lot braver in what I'm doing. And like, and, and so I'm working towards, and I, I think I said to you, I, I can't really, I don't really want to say too much because I feel like I'm sort of jumping the gun before I've even got the right blocks fully in sort of in place and, and with cement tightly locked around them. But I, I know that I'm passionate about heritage. I'm passionate about, you know, which is ironic in some ways. And people might think, God, I'm sort of, you know, primogenitor is very much still a thing. And actually there's nothing about me that would ever want to inherit where I grew up. I've absolutely had the luckiest and and sort of in my eyes the best the best deal because I I get to, you know I've been lucky enough to grow up there and don't have to bear the enormous weight that comes with sort of you know being in charge of it um so in in many senses I'm immensely grateful that I don't have to do that but doing the podcast with my mother that was a side hustle that I came up with when I was in the states and you know I think I've it's taught me and shown me how much I care about heritage and and I mean that collectively like I mean that to encompass all of heritage uh, be it lived in heritage that's still you know owned by seventh or eighth or tenth or twelfth generation families or heritage such as the National Trust that you know does an amazing job looking after 500 properties that otherwise would have gone into disrepute and and undoubtedly have been taken down or the or English heritage I basically think you know in a po- in post brexit in a post brexit Britain I my my long held belief is that we have to get a little bit more brave and brazen about about celebrating the brilliance of our past, whilst also reflecting on it and learning from it. Because there's obviously been a lot of our history and our heritage that's not to be proud of. But I think it's immensely important that we that we're a bit more American about our our history. Because you know I think it's the third, you know it's nine percent of our GDP. Like tourism, tourism heritage tourism is nine percent of the of the UK's GDP. It's incredibly important, and yet we're shit at singing you know singing about it and celebrating it. And I think the National Trust has done a wonderful job of internationally now being a recognised, you know, home, quite literally, of of heritage. But there are many, many, many other institute, you know, institutions that that haven't done such a brilliant job. And I and I really so my next venture that I'm, you know, as I said, I'm raising money for it later this year, and I'm in the early stages as we speak. But it is it is going to be in in ensuring that you know the UK's heritage is really put on an international stage and like in a reimagined way. I think what I found fascinating is like Bridgerton for me and the Crown and you know you name it Emily. There's so many there's so many um, Iconic, peri- period really, dramas yeah. that have no but that have recently come out like Netflix and Amazon are piling hundreds of millions into period drama. There's a reason for that. Their algorithms are telling them that this is a very, very, very popular. It's working. Yeah, it's working. It's a very popular form of content. Why? My long held belief is that much like our podcast and what I saw with our show is that, you know, it's a it's a wonderful form of escapism. There's, a, there's an element of education there. Okay, Bridgerton's perhaps slightly more lucid with its with its sort of historical truths, but it's it's fascinating nonetheless and it gives us a world to escape into. And I think you know, you know, living in the world that we do today with the war going on in Ukraine and, and, you know, Taiwan and China and, and like, there's so much to be concerned about and actually to be able to escape into another time, which by the way, you know, I think this is the beauty to be able to escape into another time and, and have an hour of just unadulterated sort of opulence and whatever it is that Bridgerton's feeding us with or or Downton Abbey, whatever it might be, it just it's a form of escapism. And they've made it sexy. They've made heritage very sexy and palpable. They and, have, they've done a good job. And interesting. They? And I think, but I and I think it's that essence of heritage that I want to encapsulate and create with what I'm building. Because I really believe heritage is, you know, aligned with what we've been talking about. I, I find when I go to somewhere that's old, and then it's not beaver, you know, a beaver of course it is for me because it's also my home, but when I've been lucky enough to go and visit some of these places that we did on the journey of making my mother's podcast, Duchess, what was extraordinary for me is that I walk into an old place, an old building, castle, hall, whatever it might be, and I, I inst- there's an instant sense of, of 
of time and of and of the fact that we are just here for a moment. And there's something about that for me that that means it by virtue means my this moment, this you know, this uh, you know, it it contextualizes life for me in a way. And I think gives a massive perspective. Massive perspective. And I think looking back, there's something so assuring about looking backwards because you see that throughout history there's been such turbulence. And so much of the, those turbulence we're not educated about, we don't know about, because really the history has been in, in pages or dense text. And actually, I really want to bring that to life and I really want to sort of make it bounce off pages and, and you know, help sort of create that intrigue that I think history presents for all of us in this very fast paced, digitalized world. I really want to encourage more people to get, you know, to spend their weekends going to these or even if you don't want to go into the places and look at the paintings, whatever else, go onto the land, go and go and actually like walk the incredible landscapes that we have in the UK, because you by by doing so, you're you're just you're regrounding yourself. I I really genuinely think that you know more broadly, and it might sound very grandiose of me to sort of say this, but I I think I think we've done a very poor job, particularly in recent years, of underselling the uniqueness of the UK and 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 what frankly the rest of the world envies. Well, I think a lot of British people don't don't realise because we take it for granted. It's only granted until that, you sort of go outside the, the yeah. goldfish bowl that you kind of see what what gravitas it, it exactly. holds. Exactly, and that happened to me when I was in the states. I came back and I was like, I was the whole time I was there. I'd never shown any interest in any of the history at home. History in general was kind of a bit of a you know a yawn subject for me. And but being in the states, I found myself listening to sort of Dan Snow's history hits and like and constantly on my drive to UCLA, I was literally going around sort of the canyons, tuning in to history hits UK and like wanting to learn about I don't know whatever you know period of history that I felt I was massively undereducated on. I think there's a there's something about as well being in a building that was built for beauty's sake, like that you know how often do you spend time in buildings that were just built for total unadulterated beauty. And to be awe inspiring, I think by virtue of sitting in a room or being in a room, be it a chapel, a cathedral, or a, or a castle, or a palace, whatever, there is something about it that makes you think bigger, that makes you feel. Yeah, something. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I I go to St Paul's, you know, once a year just really, to yeah. just to be and sit sit in there, and I, I get that feeling when I'm yeah. sat in that building. You know, there, there's a there's a mysticism about yeah. it. You know, that there's a something something that's you know bigger than everyone. Uh, totally. Uh, uh, and it, yeah, it, it it's very awe inspiring. So I totally get that. So I'm guessing we, you can't tell us much. More I can't about say that much more, moment. but it is exciting, and I'm I'm genuinely you know it's so nice to be operating from a place of of purpose rather than like you know. And again, I'm very aware, and I'll heavily caveat this whole conversation with there's an enormous amount of privilege that I'm 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 very readily aware I have. But I am, you know, I'm just grateful that I'm operating from a, a place of purpose uh, in the choices that I'm making and with where I want to spend my time in the future and how I want to spend my time now. I think you've got a really exciting, you know, next next chapter. Thank you. You know, lots, there's lots to look forward to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I hopefully. Um, feel very, no, feel very, very grateful to have done, you know, done the work that I've done and continue. I mean, it's a lifelong journey. I but you've think. got so much, cl- it feels like you've got so much clarity now. You know? I definitely do have more. I definitely do have more. I think there's, I'm not, again, like I really, I'm really not, I'm not actually a perfectionist and I really don't advocate perfectionism. I think it's, I think it's um, really unhealthy actually, but I, but I, but I certainly hope to just, you know, maintain, like try and stay on the train of, of kind of clarity and, in, you know, um, kind of intuition and, and just, um, just looking inwards versus looking outwards as much as I can. But also being, you know, intentional and 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 yeah, just doing things that feel like the right thing to do versus, you know, versus sort of question. Because also, I'm sure, like you, you know, I think when you start doing things that um are really innate that, that you know is sort of what you want to do, things start happening. Things start happening, yeah. but it's bloody it's nerve wracking. Like it's you know, it's nerve wracking sitting here and doing the show. It's nerve wracking being as honest as I have been. It's nerve wracking doing the kind of presenting sort of stuff that I'm I've been pitching myself out to. But I just have this innate. Intu- you know it's the right that, way, like you had the the intuition that you needed to leave your yeah, your previous agency. Yeah, and I right? think it, but it's but it, you know, there's a lot of you've got to be brave. You've got to be brave. Things, no, no, you've got to have courage. But I think you know, there's a big piece in there that around this fear and courage because fear and ego are like two of the strongest forces inside of ourselves, and so many of the things that we put off or we don't do are, are because of those things, right? And so, so. So people say, okay, well, well, how do you, how do you kind of combat that? And it's like, 
it's really hard because there's so much stuff going on. I mean, you, you know what it's like. There's so many distractions and temptations. And like, if something's uncomfortable, we can really easily find, we can find loads of reasons not to go there. Totally. If something's uncomfortable, we, we can fill our freaking day with a million yeah. things, right? And as I know, you know, that's like lots of friends. And again, there's nothing wrong with it, but that's why lots of people don't do the kind of work that I've described, I've done and you've it, done. Cause it, cause it's because too it's too uncomfortable. It's terrifying. But what I say to guys that, are, are trying to understand like how to lean, how to have that courage and how to how to lean into that uncomfortableness. It's all about getting really fucking clear to begin with what's important to you and attaching meaning and knowing where you're going because then all of a sudden you can kind of clear the fucking diary and be like, no, this is important because this is holding me back. So it's that kind of it's a bit of a process to, I, I to go. For, I, I could not agree more. And I actually found this this quote earlier that I wrote down for this because I was like, it's just so true. But it, and I sadly, it didn't say who who originally said it, so we can't give them credit. But it said, um, do the things you fear and the fear loses its control over you. Yeah. And it's so true. And it's, yeah. and I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm, I definitely have, you know, I'm, I think dyslexia often goes hand in hand with like ADD or a version of, a, you know, ADHD or whatever. I've for sure got some version of ADD. I'm almost out of it. I've never been diagnosed, but I'm almost. I think we probably all have. Like we probably know. all do, particularly in this day and age with the distractions that we have. Agreed. Agreed. Um, but I think you know procrastination is like an innate quality in lots of people that have dyslexia. And we're, again, we're all on a scale of dyslexia and other things. But I think um, procrastination is, you know, it fear. It's fear driven. It's like a. It's a fear driven. It's kind of to keep you safe. It's to sort of stop you from. And I've I've definitely you know grappling with this idea in this business that I'm building. Uh, I'm, you know, there's been a lot of procrastination that I've ha really had to work through. And again, I've got the tools now to be able to like work through that and understand where it's coming up and why it's coming up and what is it trying to protect me from. And I, I get it. But my God, if I had been trying to do this like a year ago, I wouldn't have had a clue why I was, you know, I wouldn't have, I just probably would have just carried on procrastinating. And I probably have been procrastinating on this idea for basically three years. I just didn't know it. You know, fear in this uncut is like, like a muscle, isn't it? It's like you go to the gym, you do a press up, it's really hard, and you keep doing it, it becomes easier. Even you know, I think a good example is if 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 like a guys have find it really difficult to go up to a girl and you know rather than trying to get pissed in a pub and do yeah. it that way, like just go up to someone and say, "Hey, can I have your number or whatever?" If that's really hard and really uncomfortable, well, maybe try and walk up to like a couple of strangers every day, like they can be whoever, yeah. and just and just get used to it and totally. you do it a little bit every day and then maybe you got to go and it's really uncomfortable and then you do it more and more then it just becomes like oh what's the big deal I you've just got to lean it it's like doing the podcast you know I was so nervous at the beginning and it, it gets a bit easier every time I love that idea though because for me and I you know I'm kind of slightly that strange person but for me sometimes my favorite interactions that I can have in a day and that I go to my pillow at night sort of thing thank you for are the ones with strangers the random ones the random yeah. ones the random conversations with the little four-year-old on the tube or the old the old ladies walking down the street and needs help carrying her shopping whatever it might be I genuinely think they are what makes life that those interactions are for me what adds that spontaneity to my day and but it's also nerve-wracking like sometimes I found myself sort of wanting to talk to someone and I've been procrastinating and standing there being fearful and and ultimately you realize that like in our humanity we are all they're fearful they're they're scared as well yeah, and we're actually, thinking they're probably thinking the same thing someone course. told me once be first, you know, yeah. be the, they're probably wondering the same thing. And yeah. so often they're, oh, I'm so glad you said something. I or completely whatever. agree. Yeah. And I think it's so, um, I think the other person that I admire enormously is Bear Grylls because I think the way that he touts this sort of be first mentality, like, you know, put yourself out there. Well, I can't remember what he always says. There's like, his, he's got a sort of few bylines, but all of them, I think, speak to that idea of being first, sort of, you know, being brave. And, there's a lot to be said for it. And listen, I I know like, there was no way I could have been brave last year. So I say that, I say that as someone, I say this, you know, this brave, brave stuff as someone that acknowledges you can't do it sometimes. And it's not always, it's not always accessible to you and in any given moment. But when you are feeling good and when you are feeling balanced and level, they are the times to be brave yeah, and like act it. on it and go yeah. for it. Um, but yeah, fascinating. Violet, well, I think this is a great place to, to thank wrap up. Thank you so up. much. Thank you, um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And, you know, I know that some, a lot of this stuff you haven't spoken about publicly yeah. before. And thanks for sharing it, you know. And it, it's these kind of stories and insights that 
inspire others and little tidbits of things, you know, something people will listen to this and like, oh, I'm going to try that book or oh, she did okay. this and so maybe I'll give it a try as well. Well, even if they don't, you know, I think, I, I think, I hope that it might interest one or two people, but actually I think, you know, as I said, it, it's like a mountain to climb for me coming and speaking about this kind of stuff publicly. And and I think it's, I mean, so even if it helps one person or no one, it's actually, it was much of a mountain for me to climb as it was for anyone else to sort of be interested in or not. Um, but I, I really, no, I've really enjoyed it, Charlie. Thank you so much. I think it's so amazing the work that you're doing and I really admire it because I think um, creating conversation around this kind of work is so important because by, you know, by, by virtue of doing that, hopefully, you know, more and more people will just at least be, have, have be informed so that if and when, God forbid anyone really is in a, in a moment of dark depression or deep sadness or anxiety, or whatever, there's, you know, there are public podcasts like this that they can kind of tune into and hopefully gain some insight from. Absolute pleasure and good luck with everything. Thank you. Wireless. Thank you.